um, we will do a short introduction about the start of this workshop, the, the whole aim of this workshop. So we want to really share with you guys what is generative AI and prompt engineering. So a little introduction about the three of us. I'm Avril. I'm a year two computer engineering student. Uh, I have with me... I'm Camille, a year one economics student. And I'm Cleo, year two DSA. Yeah, so we will be the main people hosting this workshop tonight. Um, and yeah, I'll pass the time over to my team. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Camille. So today we'll dive into the fascinating world of generative AI. So before we really dive in, yeah, let me introduce you what is generative AI and what is prompt engineering. So generative AI is basically about the algorithm and models um, that generates new content without human intervention. Um, so the, the algorithms and models, they actually learn the patterns from the existing data, like not only mimicking the existing data, but really learn patterns and absorb those knowledge and use those knowledge to produce new and original content. Um, so here are some examples of um, AI generated image. Um, and of course, everyone know about ChatGPT, which is also an example of um, generative AI. So secondly, is about um, prop engineering. So prop engineering is basically about um, formulating queries or providing context in a way that can um, encourage the AI to generate the response that are not only accurate, but also relevant and coherent. So our goal is actually very simple, is to optimize the quality of the AI generated output. So um, from my perspective, I think um, prompt engineering is like a bridge connecting um, the human intention and the AI capabilities. So here are some um, related applications in computing and tech. Um, first of um, first one is code code generation and programming. So um, it's basically about uh, you give a prompts about the desired functionality, logic, and structure of the code to be generated, and then AI will be able to produce the code that meets your specific criteria. And then the second one is software testing and debugging. Um, it's about um, designing prompts that describe the text scenarios, expected behavior, and um, some potential sources of errors. So the tester can provide the inputs and then guide the AI to generate relevant test cases um, to identify the problematic areas within the software. Um, the third one is about cy um, cybersecurity and network security. So you can use prompts to describe the threat scenarios, um, security requirements to guide to guide AI to um, generating actionable insights and um, strengthening the defense mechanisms. So um, on the right side, there are some courses related that are provided in NUS. So if you are interested, you may consider taking these courses maybe in next semester. So there are also some psychology principles behind generative AI. Um, first of all is about the cognitive flow. So what is cognitive flow? Cognitive flow is um, about the amount of information that um, we human brain can process, process at a time. So by using this kind of feature, we would like to um, craft prompts, prompts that are like concise yet comprehensive so that we can prevent the user from feeling too overwhelmed. Um, the second one um, on the right hand side is reciprocity. Re recipro reciprocity. Okay. Um, the people tend to like return a favor when they receive one. Therefore, by using this feature, we can um, craft forms that can provide value before requesting action. Um, so in this way, we can enhance the user engagement. Um, the third principle is about um, emotions and motivation. So um, 
We all know that users' emotion states and motivation would impact their engagement and response to the prompts. So we tend to decide, design the prompts that can evoke positive emotions such as curiosity and excitement to motivate the users to respond. Um, on the right side is about language and communication. Actually, users' um, language proficiency and their communication skills would influence their comprehension and response mm -hmm. to the prompts. Therefore, we should avoid um, some complex um, languages and maybe some jargons or terminologies. So um, just to make things simple and direct. Um, moreover, we can um, tailor the prompts to match the user's language proficiency levels and as well as the communication styles. So next is about um, some types of prompts and um, about the prompt design. Um, so today we'll be covering um, text-based prompts, graphical user interface prompts, and also voice user interface prompts. First of all, it's about text-based prompts. Um, so here are some examples. Um, the first one is customer support chat box um, that we would usually see that the first line would be, how can I assist you today? Um, secondly, it's about maybe we would like Sometimes learning a new language, we will ask the AI to translate a sentence into Chinese to, or to other languages. Um, third is about the searching engine, um, like Google, Baidu, or whatever else. Um, maybe in the searching bar, there would be a line asking, what are you looking for today? So here is a question. How do we design a effective text prompt? Um, so here are some tech um, are some tips. First is about um, to be clear and to be simple. And second is to incorporate specific details. And third is to be specific. So this this part um, our partner Cleo will explain more later. Um, secondly, it's about um, the graphical user interface. So it's basically about visual cues or elements presented within the software application or a system to guide the users in performing specific tasks or interactions. Um, so like buttons, menus, icons, dialog box, they are all examples of GUI. Um, so similarly, there are also some key principles for creating a intuitive GUI. Um, first is to keep it simple and yeah, make all their messages um, direct so that the user can understand it, get it easily. Um, the second one is to provide clear navigation and labeling. So by labeling, we can like understand um, the each um, element um, and messages behind the interaction. Um, the third one is to um, ensure the consistency um, in designing elements such as the color, the font, and uh, maybe the pictures, the styles, and other stuff. So the last prompt we are introducing today is voice user interface prompts. So it enables users to interact with a device or application using spoken voice commands. Um, similarly, there are also some considerations when we decide VUI. Um, first is to be um, clear and to be concise. Like it's just similar, like you need to convey your message in a simple way. So make sure that um, every user can understand it easily. Um, second is about personalization. So you know that um, different people, they would um, have different, like different words or phrases they use very often. So maybe um, you can um, tailor the um, UI so that you can um, in, in, like increase the user engagement. Um, the third one is about different languages. So um, even though English is like a international language, but like there are still so many people like speaking different other languages. So it's better for you to include other languages or even dialect, so you can attract a larger group of users. Um, the last one is guidance and assistance. 
So especially for the user who are like the first time to use the app or the website, so you can like guide them um, step by step so they know to like know how to utilize the whole um, product. So I will pass my time to Cleo. Thanks, Camille. Okay, now let's discuss some of the prompt design principles that will help you to craft effective prompts. So for this, first we'll take a look at clarity and simplicity. Then we'll cover contextual relevance as well as the use of feedback mechanisms. So firstly, let's understand how to make a prompt clear to a model. You will want to be precise and direct about the instruction and task that you want the model to perform. A good suggestion here is to avoid saying what not to do and instead specify what you want the model to do. This will allow the model to know exactly the requirements of the output. To make a complex prompt simpler, you will want to start with simple prompts and then build it up along the way. So this can greatly reduce the complexity and allow the model to work on it step by step. And at every step, if the output is not what you desire, you can guide it towards the desired output. And remember that you should not add unnecessary details to the prompt. Moving on, it is important to craft prompts such that they generate responses and align with that, that align with the given context. And a good way to do this is to incorporate domain-specific vocabulary in the prompts. Alternatively, you can prime the model to output its responses in the style that you desire. For example, in the, in the style and quality of an expert in the field. And this way, the prompts will suit the style that you want. Informing the model about current events and recent trends can further enhance the contextual relevance such that the output is tailored to specific user contexts and tasks. Lastly, let's discuss feedback mechanisms. So we all know that prompt engineering is an iterative process that involves refining the prompts based on feedback and evaluation. And so a way to get the feedback is through feedback loops. So feedback loops are a process by which a model can receive input, learn from that input, and then use what it has learned to modify its future outputs to suit you. This can also help identify biases, errors, or inconsistencies in the model's response. Now, I will cover some simple techniques of prompt generation. So current models such as ChatGPT3 are tuned to follow instructions and are trained on large amount of data. Hence, they have zero shot capabilities. So for those who, who aren't sure what this means, this means that they can accurately perform simple tasks without any examples. So take a look at the example here. The model, the model automati automatically understands the concept of sentiment and is able to accurately classify the text provided. So when zero short prompting doesn't work, we will turn to few short prompting. This allows the user to steer the model towards the desired output through the use of examples. So you can take a look at the example here. The model has learned how to perform the complex task by providing it with just one example. So this is an, an example of one short prompting. For more difficult tasks, a larger number of examples may need to be provided. Okay, moving on. Prompt engineering is important in many fintech applications as it can enhance user interactions, making financial platforms more user-friendly and efficient. So let's consider mobile banking applications. The implementation of a conversational interface can assist users with account inquiries, transactions, and other common issues that users might face. For example, the Bank of America's virtual assistant named Erica, utilizes prompt engineering to assist with inquiries regarding account balance and transaction history. And this can even, and it can even offer financial tips to users. Similarly, investment platforms can make use of prompt engineering to acquire 
in-depth analysis and personalized recommendations for each user based on their but based on their user activity. Not only that, Chrome engineering can also enhance digital security by analyzing user responses to identify patterns and deviations from their user behavior. And so this will allow um, the system to potentially detect fraudulent activities. So PayPal system currently uses a variation of this in order to foster a more secure online payment environment. Having learned about the use cases of prompt engineering, let me pass my time to Avril to explain more about prompting. Okay, so I'll be going more into detail about um, prompt engineering and the kind of prompts that we usually use. So as we all know, to when we interact with chatbots like ChatGPT or but okay, not with, it's Gemini now, but when we key in our inputs, there are um different categories that we categorize inputs uh, by, but very in, in a very general um way of categorizing them is mainly into naive and advanced prompts. So naive prompts, and as the name suggests, is just um prompts that are very broad, very general, and does not have much detail or specificity and or context. So it's very general, it's very ambiguous, and it leaves a lot of room for interpretation. And obviously, it's not the best kind of prompts that you want to work with. Whereas advanced prompts, they are much more specific. Um, it gives of the chatbot more instructions to follow and more context information as well. The objective is very clear. Um, you want to state the purpose of the desired output. And obviously, if you work with advanced prompts, your outputs from the chatbot will be much better as well. And since this is a fintech um, collaboration with Hacker School, uh, we also included some examples with um, fintech-related stuff. So for example, if you want to work with investment for portfolio optimization, this is the, I'm not sure if you can see, but um, this is the exact input I put into ChatGPT for um, this, the, if you are not able to see, let me, yeah, the input is create an inv investment portfolio and clearly this is categorized as a naive prompt because there's no context, there's no information and there's no, um, it, it's, it's not very specific. And the output from the chat GPT uh, for is, um, it's very general, it's things that you Google and it's not really helpful in any way, shape or form. However, if you work with more advanced prompts, for example, develop a diversified investment portfolio and you indicate the number of years, the return, and your um, risk tolerance, the response given by ChatGPT4 um, is so much better. You can see that there's actually the numbers that are given to you, the suggestions are much more specific and much more contextualized. And you have like fixed bonds, domestic government bonds, corporate bonds, and international bonds that you can work with. And oh, um, I mean, oh shit. Of course, you shouldn't be um, looking for investment advice from ChatGPT, but um, this is just an example. Uh, okay, so for example, the next example will be credit risk assessment. Ninth prompt in this case will be assess the credit risk of the applicant. And again, in the same way, the responses um, outputted by ChatGPT is very general, not specific at all. But if you work with more advanced prompts, like um, consider the applicant's credit history, the recent financial transactions, and give a com comprehensive credit risk assessment. Naturally, the output by ChatGPT will be much better. And how these things, how the advanced prompts work versus the naive prompts is this thing called tokenization. Um, for generative AI, the generative capabilities by the input is given by the input text, and it's given broken down into uh, this thing called tokens. Um, for example, if you see here, unbelievably, if you input that into ChatGPT, what it does is actually, it breaks down into tokens, which can be words, subwords, or characters. What they do is, if you see the red underline, that's how they break them down first in the first step. So they break it down into characters, I, I mean letters, sorry. And following that, they will group it into um, subwords like um, UN or D. And after that, they will combine it together. And each token is converted into a high dimensional vector, which is embedding. Basically, it maps those words to its meaning. So it outputs the um, response that you that you get from the chatbot. This process of tokenization, it breaks down text into smaller units. And it's very similar to how um, the human brain looks at words as well, because that's how we 
to look at words such as vocabulary or like management. We don't look at it like uh, character by character, rather we look at look at it by like um MA or NA. That's how we um even try to um understand the word. So there's this there's two categories two categories of organization, mainly sub words organization as well as words organization. And the most common um method that um chatbots use is the sub words organization. And its advantages include more efficient vocabulary management because it reduces the vocabulary size compared to the word level synchronization. And because of that, it's more efficient in training as well as um, in, in inference from the inputs. And when you do it, if, when you do the sub words organization, it can adapt to more languages as well as specialized domains. Specialized domains. For example, if you want to create a chatbot that works with the banking industry or the medical in, medical field. We have special jargons that are used by those industries and the bots can more easily understand and interpret as well. And going more into the tokens and context window, context windows refers to the maximum number of tokens. Uh, again, uh, it refers to the words, subwords, or characters depending on the tokenization scheme that the model can process in a single prompt. So for example, the earlier versions of ChatGPT, so GPT-3, it has a limit of 2,048 tokens. And clearly, obviously, these things are not without price. If you want a larger context window, you want the bot to um get more um increase the limit to token limit, you will need more money. It will be more computationally expensive and also take more time. And how do you save the time and how do you save the money is to use uh, to have efficient use of the tokens. If you don't need um say thirty two thousand the token limit, you stick with the six thousand token limit. If you are working with just a normal chat GPT uh, for your school work, you won't need so such a high um limit for the number of tokens. But if, for example, you're doing a banking industry and you're working with very high um, level stakeholders, obviously then you will need more money and the budget will be higher as well. And another way to save that money is to use dynamic tokens. So you can dynamically adjust the context window space on the length of your prompts, which is a very common way of doing that as well. And linking this back to the naive and advanced prompts, naive prompts when tokenized, the prompts may not provide the enough nuance to guide the model's response. So for example, going back to the naive prompts of like maybe help to uh, assess the credit risk of this user. When you have such a naive prompt, it will not use the model's token capacity very efficiently. You're not making good use of it. And when the tokens derived from the naive prompts may be very gen generic and leading to the models to re rely on more generic um, information and the outputs from the chatbot will not be so um, reliable. But if we use um, advanced prompts, right, the tokens derived from these prompts are very specific. They give very clear guidance on the model and it leads to a more accurate and relevant response that you can use. So the tokenization process, um, when you use advanced prompts, it captures more detail, it captures more nuance, and it potentially uses the mod model's token capacity more efficiently, and you can um, enhance the quality of your output. So the advanced prompts include specialized vocabulary, like I mentioned just now, when you are, in, for example, in the banking industry or the medical field, you have specific jargons that you use, and these are less common words that laymen might use, so it's more unique to what you require the bot to do. And the uh, link between tokenization and prompt engineering, the level of detail and the length of the prompt really directly impacts the number of tokens that are generated during tokenization, as mentioned earlier. For advanced prompts, um, when you provide more detail in the input, it will generate more tokens, which will um, in turn translate to more e effective guiding of the model to um, output more um, relevant responses, but it also confuses more of the context window. So if you want to maybe strike a good balance between um, the level of detail as well as the context window usage, you want to really have, find a good balance between the quality and quantity of your, of your inputs. And the quality and the specificity, specificity of these tokens are much more important than the number of inputs that you have. Because um, as you know, the more you use chat GPT or the more um, maybe like rubbish you input into the, into the bot, the, the outputs that are given by the ChatGPT bot is also not very good as well. So well-chosen tokens in the advanced form can really um, significantly en enhance the model's understanding of what you need it to do. Yeah. So 
I think we have come to the end of the content sharing. Can I assume that you guys have created your... Anyone here has troubles creating a new account or not willing to create a new account? You need a secret key. Uh, no need, uh, but um, like, because... Uh, no, the reason why I need your... I mean, it would be good to create a new one because new accounts have a uh, free... Um, free usage of like the API to open the API keys. So for example, um, new accounts have $5 credits, right? To use the API key. If you, if you don't have a new account, then you cannot unlock the API key to follow through with like our hands-on portion. Yeah. I mean, if you created your account, I think three months before, then it should still be available. But if not, yeah. But let me know if anyone has trouble. Yeah. Have, have, have. You have, huh? Oh, I mean, uh, I created this, like, as you can see, March 17th. So, I was, there. there's a free $5 credit. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, la. then by then, I mean, then the credit will have been expired already. Yes? Uh, you, you, you should still be able to open the API keys. That shouldn't be a problem. Because mine also linked to my um the account I'm using now. Anyone has problems? So we'll start in like a minute. Uh, you go to open AI. Uh, it should bring you to this page, right? Then there's the menu part here. Log in. API, yeah. yeah there's the then you go to usage. Oh, um, yeah. So if you don't have a like a dummy email or like an extra email you can use. Okay, okay, then never mind. I will, I will let you, I will create a new, but please don't keep running it. If not, like you empty my uh, bank account. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you, you, you try first. Anyone has problems? Anyone still has, doesn't have their API key yet? Okay, um, we can start now. I'll, I'll just slowly go through. So those who are still generating their, they're creating their new account, then uh, you all take your time. Okay, for those that have already created their new um, OpenAI account, you all can follow along. So I would like you guys to go to this thing called Google Colab. Um, it's basically like a Jupyter notebook, but it's so much easier to code using Python when you're using the Jupyter compared to Jupyter Notebook. So go to Google Colab and create a new notebook. I have created one prior to this, so um, it, should, it should show you uh, something like this when you create a new one. Okay. So what we will be doing for this hands-on portion is that um, as you as we have introduced to you just now, what is prompt engineering, um, the number, all the different type of prompts that you feed into the into your chatbot using uh, any uh, AI ML model, right? For now, we're using like OpenAI API. So for whatever messages or whatever inputs that you put in, it will generate um, the type of responses that you want. So what we're doing today will be doing like a personalized chatbot that has the character that you want it to have. So if you want to create like a very encouraging bot, then you'll be you can do that. If you want to create like rest a classic bot to create to rest output like um snappy responses to your questions, then you can do that as well. So this is what we'll be doing today. Um okay, so if there's no problem, we can continue. Uh, okay, so this should this should be rather easy to follow. 
what we need, what I'll need you guys to do firstly is to set up your OpenAI library. And the first, very first step to do this is to install the OpenAI library. So, so what you what I would like you guys to do is to pip install OpenAI and run this. It should take like a, some time. What? Oh. Uh okay, okay, then give me a bit. Let me do this first. Is this Tesla shares? Sorry? Is this Tesla shares? Like the 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 uh Google Collab. Oh no, uh you can create your own notebook, yeah. So when you pip install open AI, it should you should have no problems running this on your running this locally on your laptop. Okay. Um until now I think it should be fine. Uh, okay, so once you have installed the open AI library, um you need to import the library locally as well. So from open AI, you import the library. And just run it. Um, after you have imported the open air library, this is where we need the to <laughs> this is where we need to set up the API key. So um, what you need to do is you go back to open AI and you create a new secret key, which is uh just copy this. Once you have copied your OpenAI secret key, you go back to the what you what you need to do is you need to set up using the syntax. So OpenAI. Of course, a good practice is to protect your API key because it's it's secret and you don't want people you don't want other people to, to be able to access what you have and to access your API key. But for the purposes of this workshop, you can just put it here. Yeah. So if you want to set up your open AI, open AI key, what you need to do is to just uh, assign the open AI, the API key to the client and run it. Should take quite a while. And I think following that, we can go to, I guess, the prop actual part of the creating your own chatbot. Um, okay, so what we'll be creating is called the collection of dictionaries for your chatbot. What it does in this portion is every time your chatbot wants to create and uh, output a new response, right, to, to respond to your input, um, it will refer to this portion as like a um guide guide guidebook a guideline to know what kind of response it, it want it should be outputting. So it's basically like the personality or like the brain of your chatbot. And how you will want to create this portion is just the message messages equals you open curly bracket and in this portion you will have three different um uh roles in like the messages in the messages <laughs> portion so the first one will be the role uh remember the the col the semicolon comes after like the brackets so role just follow this like oh, oh by the way all these can be found on the open AI website so if you need reference you can go there as well Okay, so if you see here system, right? This basically basically gives you the personality of your chatbot. So for me, for if I want to create like a very sarcastic chatbot, you can say, you can just like tell the chatbot what to do. So you are a sarcastic assistant. And your responses should be full of sarcasm. 
So this basically is like the, the brain of your chatbot. When it wants to decide what kind of responses to output, it will go back to this messages portion and it will take instructions from here. So you can create whatever kind of personality you would like your bot to have. But for the sake of this, I'll just go with like the caustic assistant. Um, okay. And next, um, like every other gener generative AI model, it learns it learns best when you give in sample inputs and give a sample outputs that you want the bot to give to 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 respond to you. So it learns better this way. And how you want to do it is same thing, same syntax. It starts with flow. And now instead of a system, you will have user to just give the what an example of what kind of responses or what kind of questions that the, the person that's using this bot can possibly ask the chatbot. So user content. For example, what is the weather like outside? So this is like the sample question that you, a very typical kind of questions that you put into ChatGPT and, okay, not really, not really, you don't really ask ChatGPT what the weather is like outside, but um, it's, a, it's an example question that possibly you possibly ask the chatbot. So after you put in the user, possible user content, um, okay, I'll just give you a bit. Now we we'll want to um, teach the chatbot example of responses that it should be giving to better teach the your chatbot how to respond in a in this context a stochastic way. So similar same syntax. It starts with role, and now it's the assistant. Similarly, it's the content. So essentially, the only thing that changes in this is the middle portion, which is either system, user, or assistant. System is basically the, the personality of the chatbot. It's a stochastic assistant. User is the example of questions that you ask your bot. And assistant is the example of responses that you get. And for example, if you want a stochastic response, you want to teach the bot what is an example of a stochastic response is, oh, I don't know. Maybe look at the window outside. Because the more examples that you give the bot, the better it learns. That's how, that's usually, I mean, that is how um, machine learning models work. The more, the more number of inputs that you put in, the better, the better the responses it gives you. And it clearly, obviously learns better when you have more uh, inputs that you want the bot to learn. So, can go ahead to create more sample inputs and more sample outputs. So I'll create just maybe two or one or two more. Uh, so maybe example is like, what does HTML stand for? Don't forget to add like a comma after each uh, line of code. And so what you want to do is just alternate between the user, the assistant, the user, the assistant, sim similar to how you will talk to ChatGPT and uh, just follow that syntax. So what is the example of a sarcastic response is, oh, I don't know, Google it. So I'll just add one more. Um,
Okay, so I think um having three example of three example of response and outputs should be enough to work with. Um, what you can do is you run this and your bot will basically learn what uh what are sample outputs that you want the bot to give you. a minute or so to finish this of course if you add more um outputs and pos potential inputs the bot will learn better but because for the, for the purposes of this workshop we can just work with three with like the interactive loop so how you want to interact with this bot and make it work so i believe most of us here will have at least some experiences with um, coding in python um, so this is basically the language you'll be using today. So we'll start with while true and everything will be in the loop. Uh, what you want to do is to you want to input the command first. Okay, these are just comments so you don't have to follow, but it will make it clearer for you guys. So I will add this. Um, assign it to the user input. I mean, this one, um, I mean, you can do it however you like, but just for the sake of this workshop, we will do it like that. And as with any bot, you will need to enter and you will need to exit. So yeah, I'll, I'm assuming most of us have Python knowledge, so I'll go a little bit faster. Sorry, slight typo just now. And this one you can um print whatever kind of exit messages you want. So maybe to suit my bot, my sarcastic bot, you can be like. So sad to see you go not. Then you break. Okay. This is the part where you need to maybe have a bit more Python knowledge and you need to append the user input into its categories, into the message list. So the the bot knows what um what kind of input they are putting in. And this is with the portion where we call the API. This is the, the, the function that is given to us by OpenAI. And it updates maybe every few months. So if you want to use this um, API call, you have to be updated. Um, you will have to refer, keep referring back to the open AI website because they update it every few months. So if you use this thing in like two, three months time, it will not be the most updated. You, you won't be able to run this bot. Um, so API, uh, I mean, open AI has 
lot of different models. And what which the one we will be using now or the one that is most commonly used is the 3.5 turbo. So this is what we will be using. So it will input the messages as what? As the messages la, clearly. Then the model that you'll be using is GPT 3.5 turbo. All the different models are listed on the open air website, so you can feel free to um, play around with the kind of different models and see what kind of outputs that um you can get from the the bot. So clearly the bot will not be of use if you don't print the responses. So this index also changes every couple of months. So you will like if you really will want to keep updated with the open AI and generative AI realm, then you will have to keep on going back to the open AI website to refer. Uh, if not, you won't be able to run using the AI, uh, the, the API. And lastly, just again, this all these can be found on the opening app website. I think we can send this to you later after the workshop, so it's easier as well. If you um code this using VS Code or any other IDEs, um, you will have the function to complete your um like these things for you so it might be easier but yeah okay so that's about it for the interactive loop so maybe i can just like put this on screen for a little bit more So I'm going to run this, then you will be able to interact with the bot that you created. So enter the command if you want to say hi. As a, oh, okay, wait, give me one minute. Oh, sorry, typo. So if you want to create a sarcastic bot, right, you 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 commanded the bot to be sarcastic. Naturally, the responses you give will be sarcastic. And so, for example, um, what? How say? What is one plus one? Yeah. Then you would naturally get a sarcastic response because that's what you wanted the bot to do. Um, maybe more examples. How to get a Gene Street internship. Yeah, so. So basically, um, if you can, the bot is free for you to personalize. If you want a bot to be sarcastic, you want a bot to be encouraging, um, you can go ahead with that. And this is how, um, this is how, you can call the API and this is how you can interact with, you can create your own chatbots. If you want a large, if you want to scale this project to be even bigger, in a much larger scale project, you can use the API for many other purposes to create for your site projects or to even use the API keys to, to use the chat GPT, the open AI API to um, use it for your own uh, chatbots in your prompts, in your site projects. So this is just a very brief example of what you can do, how you can personalize your chatbot using the OpenAI API. And you want to close it, you can just exit. Yeah. Um, to sh so I guess prove that uh, what the messages here are actually is actually the, 
the playbook or the brain of this bot. I have created uh, other possible dictionaries. So for example, if you want to, I'll be sharing this like GitHub repository with you guys later. So for example, if you want an encouraging bot to work with, then I will just, these are all very, I guess, encouraging responses. And if you run this, and you run this, you say hi. Yeah, you ask the same question. What is one plus one? Yeah. So it will output it, its response to you will be what you want it to be. You'll be encouraging and yeah. So you can edit this at this however you want. If you want your bot to be nice, you want it to be mean, that's how you work with the API. I think this should be rather easy to follow. Um, So you can play around with this um, chatbot. Uh, can customize it however you want. Meanwhile, I will uh, keep this on for a little bit more. Yeah, I'll keep this here. Meanwhile, those that those of y'all who are, I guess, want to see what other things that this um the Open AI API can do. Um, so there, there's a lot of different functions that you can use the API for. So like if you want to um, generate text using the OpenAI API, you can go ahead with that as well. All these are on the OpenAI website. So uh, there are many different, I guess, tutorials and guidelines to do, uh, to follow. And the best way to make use of this API is to, it's not really to go to YouTube because a lot of the YouTube videos, they are very outdated. Um, this website gets um updated like one two every one two months. So the videos you watch on YouTube are usually um rather outdated. Um, to give some context, I tried to um follow some of the YouTube tutorials to do this, and most of them are actually not applicable anymore because that's how fast the, I guess you guys know as well that that's how, that's how fast the tech industry moves. So. They update they update this very often. So the best way is just go to the OpenAI website straight and learn from there because they have all the sample codes available. Um, all you have to do just honestly just copy paste into VS Code or whatever IDE that you are comfortable with and just run it. So you can also do like speech to text or text to speech. You can do image generation, um, but some of these purpose, to, some of these functions that you want to use them for, you may need to upgrade like your account or you have to pay for um, more tokens and to pay for more usages, like the, the amount of um, tokens you want to use. So it's pretty cool. You can play around with um, the open AI website and just see what, the interesting things that um these things this um prompt engineering can really like do for you guys. So if you are more familiar with Node.js, that's also you can also use it. And but I think what more 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 people are comfortable with will be Python. And yeah. If you are not so, if you don't have that much background with coding, with programming, OpenAI also has this very good um, thing called Playground or like assistance where you don't have to um, create code. Uh, to, you, you don't have to code to create your own chatbot. You can just input what kind of instructions you want to give. For example, you're a helpful assistant, you're a sarcastic assistant, and you can choose the model that you want to use. What we used just now was the 3.5 Turbo. So you can just 
play around with this. Yeah. <clears throat> And at the same time, keep track of your usage because it is really not that expensive. But if you keep running it, if you keep calling the API, um, yeah, you might risk. But you honestly won't because I've tried doing this like so many times and I only use like two cents. So yeah, I, I don't think it's that big of a problem. Yeah. So... Yeah, that's about it for side by side of the last one. Oh, yeah, uh, in the camera. Okay, for those that are, I guess, done with uh, this hands on portion. Um, I think we would like to get you guys to do like a feedback. 